Does manual treasury management and operations have your crypto business stuck in the slow lane? Scale up and speed ahead with Fireblocks, the number one platform for crypto operations and trading pros that makes custody, settlement, and rebalancing quick and easy. Visit fireblocks.com to learn more. This episode is brought to you by Coinbase Prime, an integrated solution that provides institutional investors with an advanced trading platform, secure custody, and prime services to manage all of their crypto assets in one place. Futuristic companies like Tesla and MicroStrategy have used Coinbase's comprehensive investing platform to execute some of the largest trades in the industry. Learn more by visiting coinbase.com prime to get started today. Eager to make more informed decisions around crypto using data you can trust, Chainalysis demystifies cryptocurrency by providing industry-leading compliance, market intelligence, and investigation support for all crypto assets for organizations like Gemini, Crypto.com, and BlockFi. Maximize your potential with the leading blockchain data platform by visiting Chainalysis.com now. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your host, Frank Chaparro, Director of News at The Block. Very excited for our guest on the other side of the mic. He's got more energy in person than he does online. Avi Fellman, Portfolio Manager at Block Tower Capital. Avi, it was a journey to get you on the show. The markets kept keeping you away from us. But I'm, I'm excited because I think we have a lot of traders come on and we talk about sort of the macro picture or rather like the market structure that they're dealing with or the trends they see shaping the market. I think this is a good opportunity to kind of look at the micro minutia of being a trader, right? The reason you couldn't come on the show yesterday as scheduled was because this news started breaking about Russia. So maybe we can kind of start there. Like as a trader, how does this information come in and how do you parse it apart and, and realize very quickly whether it's going to be, bearish or bullish for a given asset what does that process look like that's a really really good question and actually i'm pretty thankful that we had to reschedule the podcast twice because it's given us a little bit more fodder to talk about with the last time bitfinex this time russia and these two news events i think they're a perfect example of how a trader in they give perfect examples of how a trader would interpret an event act and then make decisions So as a portfolio manager, just as a high level statement, my job is to really have context on the market. And my job is to oversee the portfolio for the main flagship fund at Block Tower Capital and all the trappings that come along with that. So it's my job to know whenever an event comes through, whenever a catalyst comes through, whenever a headline comes through, to be able to see that and react to it because I'm in the weeds, because I know what's happened previously, because I understand precedent and I understand how the market might react. And this is actually extremely important in crypto because often crypto markets won't react in the same way as the traditional markets will to specific pieces of news. Now, often over time, they'll react the same, but there'll be, there'll be delays or there'll be quick, quick reversals. But in the moment as a trader, It's your job to understand who the market participant is, what they're going to do on that headline and and how they're going to act. And I think this is a beauty of being a trader in general, is it's your job to sit back, assess the landscape and make something out of it, right? It's your job to interpret the world. And that's really the beauty of it in, you know, and the the beauty of the job and why, why I love it so much is because I'm constantly getting pieces of information that I need to make sense out of in a way that other people might not be able to make sense of, right? And that, that's what separates the good the good from the bad. Now, that's true of headlines, that's true of short-term information, but it's also true of long-term information, right? As a trader, as an investor, you have to sit there and you have to understand, well, what are the trends over the next two hours? What are the trends over the next six months? What are the trends over the next five years? And how do I position myself accordingly to make sure that I'm not caught off sides by all of those different trends. So what I heard when you when you first introduced me and the types of conversations you've had in the past, and obviously I've listened to the scoop and 
you bring you bring some great people on. I think the main angle that people are coming at the markets with is a is a one to two year lens, but that's a lot longer than my lens. I incorporate that one to two year information in my trading and my positioning and what you know and what I'm doing with my life, right? As a crypto as a portfolio manager for for a large crypto fund that betting pretty heavily that over the next two to three years, crypto is going to go up. That doesn't necessarily mean I think that it's going to be bullish over the next three weeks, over the next two hours, whatever it is. So my setup basically is to understand as much as I possibly can about the crypto markets at any given moment. And so I structure my team in order to do that, because I think what you need in order to be successful is context. And the way that you get context is by being part of the market, right? And by reading all the all the news sites, all their all their publications, reading reading the recent research, and relying on your analysts to pass you the most pertinent information at any given time, and having a deep understanding of history, I think what you'll find is that almost all of successful portfolio managers, investors, and traders have a deep appreciation for financial history because everything that we've seen has played out before. And so if you can understand how things have played out before, then you might have a better understanding of how things might play out now. And so really, it's, it's all these things combined that, that lead me to, to where, where I am today, talking to you about how I assess the markets. Yeah. So this assessment process is kind of something that can be replicated over several different instances. When something specific like Russian news breaks, um, what what was the thinking there? Did you did you sort of have tools in your toolbox from previous um, the previous instances of conflict in the world that did something to Bitcoin's price, or was it new? Like, how did you parse through that event specifically? So that's a it's a great great question. I'll dive into the specifics. So let's 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 use that let's use that as a good example to walk through Russian news hits. I see a tweet that says. Biden says that Russia could take Kiev in three hours. That's that's the tweet. That's when the news that's when the news started breaking. Yeah. What's your next move after that? Next move is to okay, you go you go into your mental file and you think, Am I prepared for this? Have I thought about this situation? Luckily, the answer was yes, right? Because the Russian news has been percolating for quite some time. So whenever you see things that could potentially be narratives, what I do in my process is I think about them think about how they might evolve, think about the headlines we might see or might not see, and try to plan ahead for how it would react to those react to those certain situations, right? So I know that Russia has been a thing. I know that previously, in November, in December, Bitcoin was taking large hits because the Fed had introduced large amounts of uncertainty to the market. And uncertainty is an environment where Bitcoin doesn't particularly thrive especially as it pertains to risk assets. And so I see this headline. I know that the context is that the Biden administration has been warning about Russia for quite some time. I know that Bitcoin doesn't like uncertainty. I read the headline as being extremely uncertain. So I check the S&P. The S&P is going down. Normally what happens is that Bitcoin does track the S&P either immediately or with some lag. And I noticed that Bitcoin hasn't really sold off yet. And so in my mind, I have a couple things now. I know that this headline has introduced more uncertainty. It hasn't reduced uncertainty relative to the past. It's actually introduced more based on what people understand. I know the S&P is going down a little bit. I know that Bitcoin doesn't like uncertainty. And I'm looking at the markets and I know historically that in times of uncertainty, it's actually altcoins that get hit the most. So if I'm sitting there at the moment and I'm saying, okay, I want to make a trade, and this all happens in the span of, you know, you, you have to think about this in 15, 30 seconds, right? So you, you need to just make those connections. You sit there and you go, okay, if this is true, then I need to start de-risking a little bit here, right? As, as, just, as just a portfolio manager. So maybe not selling Bitcoin per se, but moving some alts into Bitcoin or Ethereum. Right. You just, it's, it's prudent. If, if, you're, if you're timely to de-risk. Now, this would be completely different if I had come across this news 30 minutes later. Because 30 minutes later, what happened was that the markets had already started pricing that in. And so what I would be doing is I'd be selling into a priced-in market. And so it also depends on 
what the market is doing at that moment that you've seen the news. You know, a great example of this was I didn't I didn't trade the BitMEX indictment uh, because what happened was in October of 2020 when the BitMEX indictment came out, I was actually late to the news. I wasn't on the desk, so I didn't trade it because by the time I got that information, I understood what it meant. I did the same mental calculations, mental mental backflips, if you will, to get to to get to my conclusion. But it was already priced in, right? And so that that's sort of the last step is you have to understand, okay, well, what's what what is the reaction to this news? What is it going to do? Is this a short term move? Is this a move that's going to change on a long term horizon? Uh, the the price action of Bitcoin is this a de risking as a trade for three hours, or is this a de risking as a okay? I'm gonna I have a little risk on, so I'm gonna step back. This is new information. And I'm going to say, hey, over the next couple of weeks, I just need to be lower risk because this is going to play out over a long period of time. With this Russian news, my interpretation was this is something that I'm probably going to need to watch for a while. So I'm going to de-risk over the next you know, one to two weeks. I, I, I don't often take trades where I'm trying to snipe one to two percent. That just isn't, it's not conducive to trading a book at the size that Block Tower is that you, I wouldn't be able to do that. And, it's not really worth worth the time to be making one to two percent moves, but you know, if 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 some if some new information comes out where you have to reassess over a longer time period, then you have to make the move. You you got to make the move quickly. Even if you didn't necessarily make the move, it still contributes to a narrative or a theme that can inform your decision making in a similar future event or a follow up event from that original incident. Correct, correct. And you know, this is um, th- this is just one type of trading and thinking that I do. Uh, this is very much so macro related. And I'll be the first to say that my edge, my edge in macro is not that great. And I don't think many people that trade crypto have amazing edge in macro. I don't think, uh, I don't think there are many people you know, at large that have amazing, uh, amazing macro skills. I think that you know, they're, they're a very small concentrated group of people that have uh, that have edge and macro. I mean, like look at look at the top hedge funds returns over the last month. They're all down a crazy amount. These supposed macro experts, right? That should have that should have sat there in November and they should have looked at the Fed as all the backwards looking analysts are looking now. And they said, well, the Fed pivoted in November to be bearish risk assets, and so you should have known in November. Well, did anybody did anybody play that perfectly? I mean, very few people. Very few people, right? So it's. It's one of those things where um, you know it's you, you you have to be a little bit humble with these with these types of trades and with with these types of moves. But there is edge to be had specifically in crypto because crypto does actually lag these moves pretty substantially in certain environments, right? So one example is uh, when we were trading forty five k, there would be periods of time where Bitcoin would outperform the S and P, and everybody and their mother they would say. Look at this. Bitcoin's outperforming the S&P. Decoupling. Let, let me let me tell you, the vast majority of time that Bitcoin decouples from the S&P, it's because of a delayed reaction. It's because Bitcoin has some idiosyncratic crypto native bidder that isn't paying attention to broader risk markets that has stepped in, decided that that's the level that they want to buy, is holding Bitcoin there. And when they're done or when a few of them are done, then Bitcoin just follows through. Right. And so you have to be very you have to be very careful. Right. When when it comes when it comes to buying that type of strength. Right. Um, Just just something just something to note. The best is when the S&P is sideways and Bitcoin's going up a little bit. Then you can start to say, all right, well, uh, you know, if the if the S&P is if the S&P is going sideways, Bitcoin's going up a little bit. That's a little bit more interesting to me than the S&P is going down and Bitcoin hasn't gone down. Right. That's uh, that that's always a little bit scary because, to me, what that suggests is that there are a bunch of sellers waiting on the sidelines and basically selling into this idiosyncratic bid. So the process is pretty simple, though, if you think about it, right? There's two questions, and I, I appreciate your humility uh, about your level of expertise in macro, but you don't necessarily need it if you have this framework. Question one: Is this event, whether it's macro or not, going to add risk to to Bitcoin or crypto? If so, then then here's the 
derivative action? Or is it something that, am I timely? Is it happening within a time frame where I can be reactive to it? If yes, then act. If no, then don't. So there's kind of like this this tree uh, flow chart that you're following. And if it's yes, okay, then do this. If it's no, then then do something else or don't do anything at all. I kind of want to flip the the conversation to when you're making a move or putting on a trade during a time in which there's not really something going on, right? Market's quiet. There's no news. Is is that almost the perfect opportunity to do something big in size? I know you guys, I, I think right when we were around bottom, put on a big Bitcoin trade. Um, I don't know if we can say how much, but I heard through the market. How does something like that happen? Almost like not reacting to news, but still putting on a big position. How does that the thinking work there? I'll say that there are a couple of ways to approach to approach this market. You can constantly be in the market. You can be somebody that's looking to pick up small edge in a bunch of different places. You can be somebody that's looking to bet exclusively on high conviction scenarios, or you can be a person that mixes the two approaches in in some way. And, you know, from an outsider looking in, you'll say, well, obviously mix the two approaches, right? That's that's obviously going to lead to the best outcome. And the answer is no, because to mix the two approaches, you need a lot of resources. You need a lot of time. And likely what happens is that you become mediocre at both as opposed to being excellent at one. And so I think that the vast majority of people should choose to be excellent. They should either choose to be picking up a bunch of small free wins or waiting that they're like moderately convicted on, you know, small, just small wins that you're moderately convicted on or waiting for scenarios to swing large. Now, our, our approach, because we have a lot of resources, is we try to, we try to do both. And so what you're kind of asking about in the first, in the first area, actually, is you know some of those some of those small bets that you have that you have moderate conviction in that you just take because you think you have you think you have a slight edge and you just make a bunch of repeated bets like that over time and you're gonna you're gonna make some money. The second thing that you're talking about is okay, you're putting on a huge Bitcoin trade. How do you get that conviction? So how do we get that conviction? Well, a lot of different ways. You know, there are many things that you have to look at in the cryptocurrency markets to get a sense for what the markets are going to do at any given moment, the two things that it boils down to, and then you can sort of build your tree of indicators under that and pieces of information under that are momentum and value. And I've talked about this on, uh, you know, on, on some tweets and, and, and some other podcasts, but it's, it's so important that I, I don't think I could ever talk about it enough is there are really only two reasons why people buy Bitcoin. Really only two reasons why people buy crypto. And that's either because they look at it and they see that it has value at a certain price level. So they think it's either dipped enough, maybe it's 60% off the highs, maybe it's reached a price target that it blew through and then retraced back and they didn't get in the first time. So now they view this as a value area buy. Or Bitcoin's trending higher, crypto's trending higher, they have FOMO, and so they're hopping onto momentum. And so my biggest conviction place happen where both of those two things align, where both of those two things line up in a huge way. And so the most recent times we've played that are coming out of a bottom. And that's because that's almost definitionally the only time where those two things are going to line up because at a top, it's probably not going to be that. Like if you're trading 60K, if you've gone up 100% in the last in the last three months, I'm never going to find a play that I'm super convicted in because I'm only betting on value. So the only time that I'm going to get both is when Bitcoin sold off a ton, right? Or, or when the crypto markets have sold off a ton. And so the things that I assess for value are who are the players in the market? Where do, the, where do I think that they see value? And what things can I look at to tell me if, I'm, if there's value in the market, right? Right now, the biggest players are all institutional. They're all macro funds. They're all high net, high net worth individuals. They all execute in relatively straightforward and simple ways that you can track on market with different metrics. 
uh, and you can actually see them operating on the books at, at certain levels. So you, if, you, if, you, if you track those metrics, you can say, okay, well, there's more institutional action here, less institutional action at 45K, way more, way more at 30K. You know, you can, look at, you can look at things like limit bids in an order book because people aren't spoofing very often in crypto because the capital costs are too high and there's too much, there's too much stuff you can do with your capital that's higher value add than spoofing. So spoofing doesn't happen a ton in crypto on spot order books because it's hard it's hard to get leverage. So you can look at limit bids in the order book and get a fairly reasonable picture for where people want to buy and for where people want to sell. So that's on the value side. And then on the momentum side, it's really at the pivot points, right? It's really at, okay, well, we tried to sell off extremely hard. We didn't. We rebounded. Or it's we tried to go up a ton. We couldn't. We rebounded. Maybe this is a pivot point. And then you can start to hop on, hop on those trends. And there, there's a lot of things you can look at uh, when it, when it's momentum, whether it's moving averages, uh, you know, whether it's the amount of trades that go through per per hour, whether it's volumes, whether it's certain price levels, ton of stuff you can look into for momentum. There are a lot of good research papers on uh, on what constitutes a momentum factor. That, yeah, I actually uh, use use in my day to day trading. And so it's a confluence of those two things that lead to those high conviction. Uh, that's where we buy we buy a ton of Bitcoin and we basically we basically wait wait for it to go higher over over a certain time period. Um, but I think if you if you really want to if you really want to build conviction in betting huge in crypto on you know these shorter to medium time frames, I mean look if you want to bet big on a three year time frame, don't sweat too much, right? If you buy forty k, if you buy thirty k, don't sweat too much, you know. But for us as a trading fund, we're here to deliver, uh, you know. We're here to deliver results, right? We're here to deliver. Well, I can't say that. But yeah, <laughs> we're here to deliver results, <laughs> uh, and so that's that. That's what I. That's what I have to think about. Makes a lot of sense. So you look for that marriage of momentum and value um, for those more shorter term bets. What about the engaging with the market itself when you're putting on a large trade? Obviously, you don't want to tip off the market to that. How do you go about kind of um, executing on that trade so people don't catch on to what you're what you're up to? Oh man, this is this is going to be super easy. There are a bunch of really fantastic execution platforms out there that actually will handle will handle a lot of that for you. I'll give a I'll give a plug to one that we use. We're not we're not an investor in them. We just love using them. Uh, Talos is is pretty fantastic for institutional great execution. Um, so we use we use them a lot. They're, they're pretty good. You you can be you can be smart about it, right? So here's here's an example. A lot of people what they'll do is uh, you know they'll go and they'll say I want to buy a million dollars worth of Bitcoin. It's like great. How do you how do you want to do that? How do you want to buy a million dollars worth? Well, okay, a million dollars isn't so big. Let's let's scale it up. Let's do a hundred million, Frank, for for the people. We'll do a hundred million. Let's say you want to buy a hundred million dollars of Bitcoin. All right. Let's say you go to a Coinbase and you say, buy this for me. Okay, maybe they split it up between five different exchanges, but they're just buying spot. It's, why would they do that, right? Okay, you want to get a little bit more sophisticated? Start buying some futures too. Start buying some futures, start buying some spot. Maybe you don't want the holding cost, but what you can do over time is let's say you fill 50 million on futures, 50 million on spot, split across the different venues, but eventually you want it all to be spot. Okay. So what you do is you fill you fill on futures and then you do that over maybe one day, maybe two days. Hundred million actually isn't that much. It's not going to move the market crazy. But then you can start to work out of the futures position against the spot position, right? You can start to start so you can start to sell the future that you have by spot. Okay, maybe you want to get a little bit more complicated. Maybe you want a little bit more risk. What do you do? Maybe you're willing to take ETH BTC risk. Maybe you're willing to take a little bit of alt BTC risk, but eventually you want to end up in BTC. So what you can start to do is you can start to buy maybe 70% of that in BTC split across futures and spot, maybe 25% of that in, in Ethereum across futures and spot, maybe 5% of that in Solana across futures and spot, because what you're willing to do is you're willing to take that alt risk. Maybe you're, you know, it's like, all right, like what's, 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 the, worst, what's the worst that could happen? Maybe I'm, I'm a little bit bullish on alts. Maybe I want to just add general beta. Okay, you buy, you buy all those assets. And then you slowly work out of them over time back back into BTC. 
if it's a super thin market and you're worried about moving price a ton and telegraphing move, right? And so that extreme scenario, you probably only want to do like if you're trying to buy when there's super, super, super low volume, but it does, you know, it does help with execution. Give you an example of this. In July 32K, we basically teleported from 32 to 38K. We absolutely teleported. And one of the reasons that we teleported is because a large buyer on the book just started scooping up all the BTC in a super aggressive manner. And so people just started pulling their offers and this thing just, you know, sent it up 10% in a day. And so what you want to do is you want to avoid that scenario. You want to avoid sending it up 10% in a day. That only happens when there's super low volume. But, you know, if, if there is, then you have to be a little bit cognizant about, about how you're executing. So there are all these sort of tricks depending on how much risk you want to take, you know, depending on what you want to do, what you want to do at any given moment. I think a lot of people just default to, uh, let me just buy Bitcoin on spot over a long period of time. And, you know, that could be good. But for us, we're often trying to voice an opinion at a specific price. And so what we want to do is instead of saying we want to buy Bitcoin at 32K, it's we want to just get as much beta as we possibly can at 32K. So we'll split that execution across a bunch of different things, right? Having trouble keeping pace with the crypto boom? When your business is scaling up and your portfolio is growing, you don't want to waste precious time on manual treasury management or settling and rebalancing. Fireblocks can handle that for you with smart, scalable solutions for your crypto business, along with industry-leading security and expertise. They'll take care of the back end so you can focus on the big picture. Visit fireblocks.com to learn more. This episode is brought to you by Coinbase Prime, an integrated solution that provides institutional investors with an advanced trading platform, secure custody, and prime services to manage all their crypto assets in one place. Coinbase Prime fully integrates crypto trading and custody on a single platform and gives clients the best all-in pricing in their network using their proprietary smart order router and algorithmic execution. Futuristic companies like Tesla and MicroStrategy have already used Coinbase's comprehensive investing platform to execute some of the largest trades in the industry. Build a unified investment portfolio with one of the most trusted names in crypto. Learn more by visiting coinbase.com prime to get started today. Are you eager to make more informed decisions around crypto using data you can trust? Chainalysis is here to help. Chainalysis demystifies cryptocurrency by providing industry-leading compliance, market intelligence, and investigation support for all crypto assets for organizations like Gemini, Crypto.com, and BlockFi. Gain unparalleled visibility and maximize your potential with the leading blockchain data platform by visiting Chainalysis.com now. It's funny if you think about um, we kind of we kind of grew up in the space at the same time together. Um, if you rewind the clock to 2018, it was or late 2017. News just had so much of an impact on the price of coins, and now not so much, right? I I, I don't know if you ever think about this, but sometimes I'll look at headlines and I'll think, wow. Why are we not like surging or the antithesis? Why are we not like, why, why is shit not hitting the fan? Um, and, and then there are certain instances where I'm surprised at the degree to which Bitcoin is maybe in complete lockstep with the broader market. Um, how do you see that those dynamics? How do you, how have you seen them change? over the past few years. Like, do you remember like back in the day, like, you know, Google would, Google cloud would announce something with, you know, um, IOTA or something ridiculous and IOTA would go up like 30%. Um, is that just a, uh, is that, is the fact that that doesn't happen so much just, um, you know, the fact that the market is so much larger, um, there's more institutional participants, um, and the people who are trading Bitcoin are also trading other assets. You know, I I really do think that that's 
basically a pure function of retail in the market with cash to spend, right? Like those those crazy, crazy types of crazy types of moves. Because look, in 2017, 2018, that was just that was pure anarchy, Frank. I remember I remember meeting you in DC that one time in, in 20, 2018. I think that's that's when we first met quite, quite a while ago. And yeah, that, that was just a that was just a completely different time. Pure anarchy, pure chaos. Every single market participant in crypto, I would characterize as retail at that time, except for very, very, very select few desks, right? There were like a very select few desks, Cumberland, Circle. There are a couple of people out there that were trading it seriously, but something like 95% of the volume was all, all retail driven. And the thing is, nobody knew anything. Looking back, very few people knew anything. The only thing that you could go off of was kind of proof of authority in a sense. And so what would happen is you'd get all these, you'd, you'd get all these news events that would come out. It was just a hot ball of capital going from one thing to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next thing. Very few people held fundamental bets at the time. And I would characterize basically the entire crypto market of 2017 and 2018, as I think CMS describes it best, a hot ball of capital, right? Looking for the next thing, looking for the next thing, looking for the next thing. And liquidity was super bad. There weren't that many market makers on coins. You know, a million dollars could do a lot, a lot of damage. And so news, that was, that was the game, right? That, at the end of the day, that, that was the game. And you kind of saw it, um, you know, you still see remnants of that in a bit today with Coinbase listings, right? So Coinbase has a lot of retail investors on its, on its site. Anytime something gets listed on Coinbase, the thing, sometimes the thing like ACH, I think this was a few months ago, the thing like 30X, right? And so sometimes you still do get these effects, but it happens mainly when you get these crazy retail investors that don't know exactly exactly where to put their money. And you need a, you need a certain environment for it. So I actually think Q1 2021 was a pretty good environment for news catalyst-based trading because there were a ton of new participants in the market. They didn't know where to put their capital. They would look at headlines and they would basically ape. And so funds would hop on it and they'd start buying up. And so maybe this is a good time just to talk about how edge dies in crypto. Basically, what happens is whenever somebody finds an edge, you know, whenever somebody finds finds an exploit, let's use let's use headlines news, for example. Originally, it's a bunch of smart guys get together to find the news before retail does. They buy the coin, they sell it to retail. Okay, that's great. But over time, that group of people gets more capital. And so they start selling more and more and more and more. They start buying more and they start selling more. So they start pricing that move a little bit more aggressively. And then at some point, retail doesn't make money on that anymore. Because what happens is they have that group of people has so much money, they price it in right before, Retail buys, retail buys, they don't make, most people don't make anything and then they just get dumped. On. And so retail stops buying. And so what happens is that the, almost the entirety of the price action comes from the people buying who are looking to sell three seconds later. And so when that happens, you don't, nobody makes any money anymore. And so people basically stop doing it, right? And so that thing, aping on news doesn't happen anymore because you don't have retail doing it. Because they, they got burned too many times. And you don't have the people that are taking advantage of retail doing it because retail's not doing it anymore. So that's kind of how edge evolves and, and edge and edge dies, which is why you go through these cycles of what does have edge, what doesn't have edge. I mean, re- remember uh, remember McAfee's coin of the day? Yeah, that's him. Yeah, RIP, RIP McAfee. Or McAfee's coin of the day, that was a great alpha generation tool for about four weeks before that exact same thing played out. Same thing happened with Elon Musk tweeting about Doge. Now it's actually if you short, if you short three seconds after Elon Musk tweets about Doge, you've won every single time the last like four times. He's done it. People just don't necessarily realize. So what are some of the easy trades that still exist that you kind of have? I don't know if automated is the right word, but you know every time, let's say coin lists on Coinbase, you're longing it or Every time maybe Elon tweets about Doge now, you're shorting it in that small time frame. What are some of the easy trades for you? Oh man, I can't I can't give away too much. <laughs> I can see it. They're not gonna see it on video, but I can see it in your eyes, Frank. Here's one that maybe is less controversial or less alpha leaking. 
But we see it every single time. There are the big cascading liquidations. Retail gets blown up offshore. There's maybe a billion, $2 billion worth of liquidation. Price drops, more liquidations. And then very gradually, but, but suddenly, you see the market being bought up by institutional firms. So retail gets blown up and then institutions buy the dip. Are you behind some of that dip buying when, when those liquidations happen? I can, I can either confirm or deny, but I can talk about how you might want to approach those situations. Sure. Yeah, go, go ahead. And I'll tell you guys, I mean, you've got a great interviewer on your side. I, I almost wanted to tell him the alpha. He's just so charming. <laughs> but it, going, liquidations is, is, I mean, it's a diminishing source of alpha. So I think we can talk about this. There's still, there's still alpha there. But really what you want to really what you want to be doing is um, constructing maps is really is really what it is. And I can I can give you the rough, rough idea of how to construct the map. So. Step one, what's your goal? Your goal is to basically buy when liquidations are done. Why? Because liquidations are inefficient. sell. it's people that don't want to sell that are forced to sell. That is the best type of person to buy from because they have zero information. They're just forced to sell. Right. The worst thing to do is buy from people that have information that you don't. And information doesn't mean solid information. It doesn't mean, oh, they know that China's going to ban Bitcoin, so they're selling into you and you're stupid for buying. It's just that in aggregate, if a bunch of really smart people are buying, then the market's probably going to go down or selling, then the market's probably going to go down. If a bunch of really smart people are buying, their aggregated information means the market's probably going to go up. Just, you know, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a weighing machine, right? Uh, people that kind of understand understand the market the most. You want to be buying from people that have zero information, which is why liquidations are so valid because they are the epitome of zero information sellers and buyers, right? So if you get a bunch of liquidations to the top side, maybe you want to sell that. A bunch of shorts getting liquidated, probably want to sell. Okay, so your job is to buy when li like as close to when they're done as possible at the best price possible. So the first thing you have to do is realize that liquidations generally occur in a cascade. So what happens is you hit a certain level where a bunch of retail people or a bunch of even institutional people, they're super long, they hit their limits, they get stopped out, they're forced to sell. Those sells push the price down, trigger another set of liquidations and limits, and then you start to tumble, 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 tumble. Okay, well, first thing, identify the scenarios in which that is going to happen. Generally. Bitcoin tends to have liquidation candles after it's been grinding down in a downtrend for a while and hits a key level. So a great historic example of this was 45K, right? Basically what we did is we traded, we traded below 45, we traded a 43, and then we basically giga nuked to 38. And then from there we nuked, we nuked to 33, right? And so these liquidation trades are generally very short time frame. Because sometimes what will happen is you'll get these liquidations, it'll bounce super hard. And then people that didn't get to sell the first time will sell off. So what I'm talking about is you're trying to buy a liquidation cascade, sell probably like an hour, two hours later. Okay. So first you identify the area in which liquidations are likely to occur. Then what you want to do is you want to identify where on the line, where on the price line, 44, 43, 42, 41, 40, where other liquidations are likely to occur. And then identify where there are probably no more long positions left liquid. And basically, the way that you do this is you look at open interest, which all exchanges publish on their futures contracts, and you look at where open interest went up and correlate a price level to it. So let's say a bunch of open interest went up at around 45. Some, like there were some open positions, open interest that went up around 43. There were zero in the last like six months that opened around 38. Yeah. There were just none, like nobody, because we had either we hadn't visited that price level, you know, or, uh, or people just didn't want to bid that price level. And so what you get is you just, there was in the last six months or three months or two months or two weeks, I'm not going to give away the exact time frame of how you want to do it, but there are just no open positions there. So then you start to build a map of, okay, there are a ton of positions of 45, ton of positions of 44, medium amount of 43, not so much of 38. And so you've identified that there's a likelihood of a liquidation occurring. You've identified where it's likely to stop, where the selling is likely to stop. And then what you do is you basically just sit there, you put in some limit bids, preferably iceberg. So what an iceberg is, is 
you're showing one BTC, but actually you've got a thousand BTC behind it. And that means that when your one BTC gets hit, you refresh on the order book, gets hit so that people don't see it in the book. And so you just basically sit there and wait for the liquidation. And then when you get hit, you basically try to, you know, there are some metrics that you can use, but basically what you're doing is you're trying to understand where that could bounce to. And then you set a bunch of asks there and you try to capture that, capture the inefficient spread. So, so that's really the map to approaching something, yeah. something like a liquidation run. But what I find is, um, you know, really the key to finding these types of, uh, finding these types of trades is you, you monitor the market. You try to understand where the inefficiencies are, why the inefficiencies exist, and what's the map that you need to draw out in order to capture those inefficiencies. And so that's, you know, a huge part of being a portfolio manager is like, look, I'm not smart enough to actually build the systems to find this stuff, but I'm pretty good at figuring out where the inefficiencies are and then working with a team to build stuff to capture. So that's really... That that's really what I focus on. <laughs> uh, I I like to say something similar about my job. I, I I'm not really smart enough to write about topics myself. I just go out and aggregate people who are smarter than me and kind of disseminate it into the world. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I was being I was being humble there for a second. It's very unnatural for me. <laughs> uh, my body's rejecting it very strongly. Um. One thing that I definitely want to talk about before we let you go is just the degree to which the Fed is in the driver's seat of the market right now. Is it and do you expect it to continue to be? Because, you know, maybe we originally thought, all right, we get it. There's going to be rate hikes. We thought it was pretty certain that there'd be four. Now, you know, some Goldman saying seven, it could be more. Um, the, the sort of degree to which those are implemented is uncertain. So there still is a lot of uncertainty. Will that uncertainty continue to kind of hang over the space? So it's funny. I was, uh, look, I don't have, I don't have the crystal ball here. I don't know. I don't know exactly what's going on. The best I can do is look at, is look at history and try to look at this with a fresh set of eyes as well. Start with the history. If you look at the history of it, uh, anytime the fed has hiked into a bull market, it's basically been, like jumping into a cold bath where it sucks for the first hike. It sucks for the first 10 seconds and then the market gets used to it. So if you look at history, Charlie uh, Delilio, however you pronounce his last name. Sorry if I butcher that, Charlie, if you ever listen to this. Um, he wrote a, he wrote a really, good, uh, really good article on this and maybe you can link in the resources we'll send you after. But basically he plots it out and he goes, okay, into the first rate hike into a bull market, you know, after, uh, you know, in 2000, in 20, in 2015 and 2018, when the Fed was, when the Fed was hiking, the first hike, you got a sell off of like 10, 15% in the S&P. And then just game over. We just kept, we kept trending up after that. And I think a lot of that is due to the ira like some level of irrationality in the market where it's, it's always the hardest when you're out of pivot. It's always the hardest to understand and have certainty about the future when you're out of pivot. Will the Fed hike? Will they not hike? How much will they hike? What's their plan? What's going on? I don't know, man. I don't know. And that instills a sense of fear in people. The moment the Fed gets done with their first hike, then you can start to say, oh, okay. So, me, so they weren't bluffing. We know that they weren't bluffing. There's still some people today that think that they might. We know that they've stayed true to their word about what they said that they're going to do. And so maybe I can start to believe everything that they're saying now. And so I can start to price that in and we can start to move forward with our lives. And so basically what, I, what I'm thinking here is that uncertainty is going to get removed around the first time that they hike, maybe four weeks after, maybe six weeks after. But kind of what you're looking for is you're looking for them to commit to that first hike, maybe in March. And you just say, okay, I can take a step back. I can breathe, I kind of understand what's happening. But we can move forward with less uncertainty now. Russia kind of threw a wrench in my plan. So I don't know. I've been publicly bullish on Twitter. I'm revising on your podcast that opinion a bit to just be a little bit less bullish. 
And so I'm always worried about voicing opinions publicly because there's always new information that comes out that other people don't realize that you've changed your mind on, but you might have changed your mind on. And so I was of the mindset that this Russia thing was probably not going to devolve into anything. I'm still of the mindset that it's likely to be a bit of a, a you know, a bit of a nothing burger. We look back in four weeks, nothing else. But you do have to admit that it spooked the market. It introduced uncertainty. And now is probably not the time to be max long, right? Whereas before I was, I was pretty confident. I was saying, okay, well, I think we've resolved. We're heading into the fir- first, first rate hike. We're saying, okay, well, uncertainty is about to get removed. Maybe you want to start positioning a little bit longer. Now I'm just, I'm still bullish slanted, just a little bit less than I, than I was before. But I think the key here is to understand that, from my perspective at least, I talk to allocators a lot. I talk to big boys that are trying to come into this market, as do you. You probably more than me. They all want to come in. They just want to come in at the right time. They don't want to get smacked in the face. They all want to buy Bitcoin. They all want to buy crypto. They all want to buy you know things. I mean, some of them are even coming to me asking me what the what the next Uniswap coin is to fund, which is hilarious for a multi billion dollar fund asking you, "Hey man, what do you like?" No, 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 no. We want it sub fifty million market cap. We want a punt. All right, dude. Um, so that was funny. But these guys, they want it. They want to come into the market. It's just that the Fed and the uncertainty of the equity markets is stopping them from doing that. And look at oil. Look at gold. Gold's done pretty well. Oil's just absolutely ripperoni right now. And so they're good macro trades out there if you want. To you know, voice your opinion on increasing inflation or increasing uncertainty, and because there's so many people that cross hold Bitcoin and equities, that's just a little bit less interesting, right? Because the alpha component there is a little bit more muddled. So what I'm seeing is people that are betting on uncertainty in the markets, people that are betting on inflation. They're okay. Well, maybe I just buy gold and do it on a little bit of leverage, or maybe I just buy oil and I do it on a little bit of leverage instead of buying instead of buying BTC instead of getting crypto. Right. Doing- and so I think uh, I think really what you need is um, people want to buy it. They see a future. You just need the uncertainty to be removed, and then I think I think we're heading higher kind of across the board. My high level thesis for 2022 and probably a little bit of 2023 is that we're ranging. We're probably ranging between 30k and 70k, and the reason for this is it takes time to digest a bull run. And so, I personally just think that Bitcoin's a massive asset. It's going to take time to transfer from weak hands to strong hands. And so, it, this is you know if 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 you ever ever wanted to take a vacation, the next six months are probably the best time to do it, Frank. So you you you, you let you let me know. I can meet you in Tulum. That's a good idea. Well, maybe I'll make it down to the islands. Um, yeah, come visit. It's been too long. I have some family there. Funny enough. Where you, Your family in the islands? I have, I have some family down what, in Puerto Rico. Would you say that you're an island boy? I'm an island boy. I'm an island boy. <laughs> We're keeping that in, right? Yeah, 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 I think we'll have to. Um, well, this certainly um, exceeded my expectations for my Saturday morning. So thank you for that. Avi, I really appreciate you stopping by. We definitely need to have you on the show again after our vacations. Um, I, 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 I took a picture of us. I look incredibly pensive. I feel like this was one of the most pensive shows I've done in a while. Where can our listeners learn more about what you're up to at block tower uh you could just follow me on twitter i'm at avi fellman you'll see me i have a avatar of a runescape character the wise, he's, <laughs> called, right. he's called the wise old man yeah and 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 we appreciate we appreciate your your wisdom today avi thanks for being on the show well thank you for having me on this was an absolute pleasure yeah Definitely was. The Scoop will be back for you again, dear listener, with another great guest. Have an awesome day.